Thank you for the introduction, Mark. Um, it's, I want to speak on behalf of the panel and say that we're very excited to be kicking off the panel discussions here at the Berlin Economic Forum this year. And it's an honor to be in front of such a distinguished group of guests. We hope that you can take away something from our discussion, uh, maybe some thought-provoking ideas or concepts um, out of our presentation today. So how we're going to do this is we're each going to come up and give a brief um, presentation about a topic of our choice regarding economies or nation branding. And then we're going to move into a discussion amongst ourselves. And after that, we'd love to have some questions or comments from the audience. <clears throat> Thank you. So today, I'm going to talk about how countries can use effective nation branding to attract US foreign direct investment. The United States consistently spends the most foreign direct investment, or FDI, abroad and also receives the most foreign direct investment year over year. In 2014, the US spent $337 billion on FDI overseas. Second in line was Hong Kong, China, with $143 billion, less than half of the United States. FDI is believed to be the most stable component of capital flows and a crucial factor of economic growth for a country and it's apparent through nations who are aggressively competing for investments by offering economic incentives to corporations. Traditionally, research on foreign direct investment has focused on these companies' economic motives for international expansion, such as attractiveness of the market, behavior of competitors, tax incentives, and so on. New research is showing that social influences also play a crucial role for foreign direct investment decision making and demonstrates foreign direct investment may be driven by some intangible factors, which are disregarded in economic analysis, but can be described by national branding. Simon Anholtz is considered the father of the idea of nation branding, and he believes it's not just about tourism, but rather a collaborative effort of the various faculty, such as the promotion of tourism, investment and trade, plus public and cultural diplomacy. For this reason, Anhold also likes to use the term competitive identity because managing the brand name of a country involves the reputation of the nation and it involves the national identity, policies, and economics of competitiveness. Competitive identity differentiates one nation to the next with its competitive advantage within the global market. So really, it's the concept of looking at soft factors of a country, the culture, the history, the lifestyle, and combining those with the economic environment to create a complete picture of a nation's identity and then marketing that effectively. So another question might be, why is this even important? Well, we live in a constantly changing global world and if a nation is not actively working to create a brand for itself, it's going to be subjective to whatever stereotypes, if any, already exist about it. Ireland is a prime example of effective nation branding to increase foreign direct investment from the United States, which can be seen from investment over the past decade. In 2004, the Industrial Development Authority, or IDA Ireland, was reestablished with the sole priority of encouraging investment into Ireland by foreign-owned companies. This government-funded organization works as a strategic partner to provide consultancy and support services free of charge to help organizations grow into Ireland. In 2014, Ireland welcomed Airbnb, Amazon, PayPal, LinkedIn, SurveyMonkey, Johnson & Johnson, and various other US-based companies into their country, all with the assistance of IDA Ireland. They took in over $58 billion in US FDI, the most of any country that year. With IDA Ireland's 27 offices worldwide, they have established a presence which is easily accessible and able to network with international business groups. IDA Ireland has played a crucial role in the revitalization of the Irish economy, especially after their recession in 2007, which turned into a full economic depression in 2009. Unemployment rates were at their highest in years, leaving a pool of highly skilled workers without jobs. IDA Ireland capitalized on what resources they had and used their skilled workforce along with the proportional cost of living to appeal to outside investors, and it worked. Even in a depressed economy, Ireland was able to attract FDI by utilizing soft factors that were marketed through an effective nation branding campaign. 
Ireland continues to improve upon and expand their branding year over year. And it's reflected in the steadily increasing FDI they receive from the US and other nations. Effective nation branding is an essential tool that countries should employ when attempting to attract US foreign direct investment. And I wanted to show an example, a very recent example, of an event that IDA Ireland hosted just a couple weeks ago um, out of their Los Angeles office. They had some famous Irish actors and they hosted an event to drive investment from the movie and media industry and to show that Ireland is a great place to uh, bring that business into the country. And with that, I would love to introduce my colleague, Mike, from Norway. Okay. Hello, I'm Michael from Norway and America. Um, I was at this conference last year, and a big topic was um, tourism and nation branding and trying to increase tourism. And it's going to be a bit the same this year, it looks like, by, by looking at the schedule. So I'd like to speak about, oh, never mind, he did already. I'd like to speak about increasing tourism to improve the economy in a country. Uh, but before I get started, here's a few quick facts about global tourism. One in every 14 people works in some area of the tourism industry in the world. Um, so that's definitely a big industry, and it's growing. It's going to grow by 60% in 2020. Mm. And the top three destinations, it's a little fun fact, China is number three now. It just passed Spain. Uh, USA is number two, and France is the number one. Uh, tourist destination in the world. And if you take all the tourism spent uh, in countries, it's 2.3 trillion people who go to a country and um, yeah, what they use in the country, but if you include everything that's included indirectly, travel and things like that, it's 7.6 trillion. So for most countries, it's definitely a, a billion dollar industry. And just to give an example, Germany spent 28 million investing in tourism last year, um, which isn't that much when you think about it, uh, considering that it's generating billions of dollars coming into the country every year. Uh, so that's what I'd like to talk about. I'd like to uh, come up with ideas, ways to increase tourism, uh, and what countries can do to uh, basically create more money and jobs in their country. Uh, so first, there's a few different types, different points I'd like to make on tourism. There's first the businesses that uh, is affected by tourism. There's the travel agents, of course, and then there's accommodation, which is also very big. Hotels, camping sites, apartments, resorts, and catering is also a big thing. Restaurants, food stands, everything. Uh, transport, we all know trains, planes, cruises. And, but the biggest one is the attractions, the theme parks, the museum. That's where the most money is spent, and that's where the most jobs are created. Um, so we know the businesses, but it's also important to look at the types of tourists. Um, there's people that travel for business, and then there's people that travel for leisure. And there's so many reasons to, do, to travel for leisure. There's for family people that, that want to take their kids on a vacation to a theme park or something. And there's, the young people, the backpackers, the, that want to do it cheap, they want to party. And there's people that want to relax and just sit on a beach and do nothing. And then there's religious tourism and there's so many different types. And it's important to know what kind of tourists a country wants to attract or what kind of... Yeah. What, what are the reasons to visit a country? Um, but there's a lot of problems that a lot of countries have too. Um, Bad exchange rates, um, things being way too expensive, being from Norway, I know how that is, no one wants to travel there, it's just way too expensive. And then the security is also a big issue. Uh, people don't want to travel to a place that's dangerous where they don't feel safe. And then also bad infrastructure, uh, transport, accommodation, that's also a problem. And then also lack of publicity. I know there's some beautiful places in the world that uh, people don't really know of 
because it's not getting the right publicity. And that's what I'd like to focus on. I think, um, <coughs> yeah, what the countries can do most to increase tourism is uh, spread knowledge of their country. Um, so I have a few ideas, uh, things that countries can do to increase tourism and increase their economy. Uh, I'd like to talk about those and then ask my colleagues and members from the audience if they have any ideas, because it's going to be a big theme in this conference. Um, the first thing, of course, a country could do would be to expand their ministry of tourism. They could set up big teams and they could do a lot more, of course. And then they could spend more investing on infrastructure and security in a country. Uh, they could also do tax breaks for uh, companies, businesses involved in tourism, uh, hotels, transport, things like that. And then one interesting idea I had that I came up with last year is uh, advertising campaigns through the media and not just commercials and, you know, those travel TV shows. Uh, nobody really watches those. They come on late night TV and they're just, they're pretty boring really. But I, <coughs> I thought about movies. If governments could work with Hollywood, you know, if they would invest some money and maybe permit the, some Hollywood movie companies to film and produce movies in their country, then that would reach a much larger audience. And uh, just, just by show of hands, how many people wanted to travel to New Zealand after they saw Lord of the Rings? Yeah. And, there, and there's lots of cases like that, just by seeing movies, because they have a much larger audience, and um, that would, uh, that's one idea I came up with. And yeah, I'd like to ask my colleagues maybe what, what they think, uh, and the audience too, if there's any problems that you see uh, with tourism in the country and other ways to increase it. Yeah. But now, this is my colleague and student, Hamza, a fellow student. And uh, yeah, he has to say some things. Um, hello, uh, my name is Hamza Amjad, I'm from Morocco. So I'm gonna speak quickly about nation branding, creative economies in Morocco. Um, where is that, as you can read? It's a city in the desert. Uh, so I'm gonna speak uh, specifically about it. I'm going to talk quickly in the beginning about nation branding and how it sometimes encourages um, creativity in developing countries. So nation branding is a phenomenon which uh, highlights non-material aspects of a country as a, consistent, a consistent source of economic development. In recent years, the concept of nation branding was an expression that includes a number of complex set of concepts. Simon, uh, Simon Anhold, who coined the term in 1998, Provide, provides a concise definition with the description of the national brand image, image of the way a nation is received and stored by the public. Furthermore, his research has shown that this appearance, uh, this appearance is, is usually a systematic attempt to create or manage the reputation of the nation, referring to the fact that nations experiencing, are experiencing constant change, which requires that image and reputation constantly maintain to develop and maintain the benefits of the national branding. In a pure economic perspective, the brand is a key factor, uh, key factor since the cost of entry in the marketplaces, the most modern are simply impeccable quality, performance, and efficiency. They are not sufficient sales for the less competitive advantage or regular sales. The brand is what drives consumer choice when products and services are, la are, are la largely equivalent. Brand is a useful summary of intangible competitive of a uh, competition, uh, intangible competitive of an organization or a country asset. Its genius, its distinctive character, its people, its promise to the marketplace. These are factors that when aligned around a clear strategy, give it a sustainable competitive advantage, the right and the ability to charge a premium and service services offered. So the application of branding techniques to nations is a relatively new phenomenon, but one which is uh, growing in frequency given the increasingly global competition that nations now face in both their domestic and external markets. For developing countries, this situation can either be positive or negative. In our age, the change comes quickly and countries have to adapt to this change or they will suffer reputation-wise. 
However, a nation can invest in its weaknesses and make of their cultural heritage a strong tool to develop their country by investing in new fields that are trending all around the world. This alliance between an economic strategy, culture, and creativity is becoming an increasing driving force in the international marketplace. And it is essential to measure their impact not only on the economy, but also on societies at large. In this era of extraordinary change and globalization, many acknowledge that creativity and innovation are now driving the new economy. Organizations and even economic regions that impress creativity generate significantly higher revenue and provide greater stability into the future. Based on ideas rather than physical capital, uh, the creative economy straddles economic, economic, political, social, cultural, technological issues and is at the crossroads of uh, the arts, business and technology. It is unique in that it relies on an unlimited global resource, human creativity. Growth strategies in the creative economy therefore focus on harnessing the development potential of an unlimited resource and not on optimizing limited resources. So speaking about the example of Wurzazat, which is a city in south of uh, Morocco in the desert, a long time ago, which was just mostly sand and a few people living there, but now it's completely different. So it was mainly a strategy of how to make of this weakness in our country uh, a strength. So in a place where there's no, no rain, we can use this, for example, for art and film. So where does it has become the Hollywood of Morocco, where so many films have been made. It's a location for the shooting of many leading international film successes. Both the national government and the local authorities took up the cinema option for the development of this heritage rich, uh, region of the country and for the diversification of its economy. In 2005, already 57 film shootings took place here or there. Current objectives are to attain 225 shootings per year by 2016 and to create 8,000 more jobs locally. Some 45% of the country's um, 140 film shootings during the period 2006-2010 were carried out in Wazazat, generating an estimated revenue intake of 75 uh, million US dollars annually. In 2008, the Wazazat Film Commission and a special fund were created to promote the zone and a twining agreement has been signed with Hollywood for capacity building and new infrastructure investment. The film in the industry is estimated to generate income directly and indirectly for nearly 19,000 people, with a cumulative turnover in the area of more than 100 million US dollars. Three studios have been established. The first, Atlas Studio Corporation, was established in 1986 by a hotel chain and has a three-star hotel set construction facilities, costumes, and lighting workshops, interior sets, and exterior spaces. The second, CLA Studios has some 40 employees provide, providing diverse uh, training centers in collaboration with the Italian group Cinecita Luce in the Italian region of Latium. All three studios have had many positive spillover effects, including tourist visits uh, to the region and a high level of intercultural dialogue with the local community resulting from the presence of different nationalities and culture. Environmental degradation, notably of the, of, the, of the traditional beach heritage, has been one of the downsides of this activity. However, new projects that have emerged from the success story include the creation of a one-stop shop for pre- and post-production in a market tracking mechanism, training programs in script writing, special effects, the upgrading of infrastructure and the establishment of financial incentives for new production companies. So this economic activity has generated a great wealth by creating a film industry hub in North Africa and establishing great potential for the development of the region with other actors and partners on a global scale. This um, might be one of the success stories in branding for, for branding of a country in a, in a developing country. As so many times I have visited World as that, and every time I meet people from all, all over the world and they're like, I came here because I saw this place in the movie. I saw this place in Gladiator. I saw this place in Game of Thrones. So I'm here. So this might, might be one of uh, ways developing countries can use their weaknesses into strengths. Thank you. And now it's for Zaskia Antelo. She'll talk about her subject.
Um, I would like to thank my colleagues for already introducing the importance of national branding, tourism as a creative economy, and the importance of movies because it's got to do with my topic as well, which is national branding through online creative economy, including internet, online games, and movies. So, um, national branding has already been mentioned, but it's a competitive advantage, and I think it should be used since we are in a globalized world. Uh, a country, especially uh, weak countries, could get really sucked up into inter internationalization and globalization. So if they take advantage of their local distinctiveness, they could really increase their tourism, bringing their economy to a rise as well. The successful transfer of this image to its export is just as important as what they actually produce and sell. So the words speak by themselves. Creative economy. Here is where it mixes with national branding, since national, national branding needs to have a specific um, brand and recognition. Each country has its own way to approach national branding, some of them doing by being peaceful, some use chocolate, others use their beautiful landscapes. They all have something to offer. So if you exploit the local knowledge like they do in Nepal or in India, you can really uh, create, uh, cre use the information to approach tourism and the international community. Uh, creative economy was developed in 2001 by John Hawkins to describe, the, to describe the economic system where value is based on a novel imaginative, meaning what the experience actually brings to the person. If you travel, you don't only do it for business or for something. If you do it for tourism, it's because it brings you something more, uh, something of m more value, especially those teenagers who don't really have a family and they just travel. They do it because of the um, feelings that it gives. And people will pay a lot of money for that feeling or for seeing their per their favorite places, their favorite movies, from their favorite movies. So it's the characteristics of being personal, novel, and meaningful. Uh, right now, the current issues in the creative economy, uh, the ones that I would like to focus on, which are online, is aesthetics, branding, network, intellectual property, digital and online software, urban design, and work. Aesthetics, we can even see them from the website of a government. If you go into the visa application or something, they already have something that characterizes that country. They have their brand, the reason why people want to go. If you go to the UK website, you're gonna see the typical London Bridge. And that many people want to travel to UK just for that. And saying it creates the branding through networks. So social media should use the networks of the branding, especially protecting their intellectual property. One of the things that we've seen is, for example, with Harry Potter, how uh, the authors say that if they wanted to make a movie, they all have to be British actors to increase. And um, really, those actors, even now, they are recognized worldwide. And not only as Harry Potter, but as British, representing Britain. Digital and online, it's a new world that we should go into because we've had the industrial revolution, the electric revolution, the computer revolution, where now everyone has a little computer in their pocket. And now it's the internet of things we need to grab before it expands with our knowledge because even, even things like ISIS are using the internet of things before we started to realize the importance of it. So national branding should definitely take an approach to the Internet of Things as a creative economy that could enhance tourism, actual factual tourism, because it's not only entertainment right now, since we have it coming at us all the time. And with that, I would like to start the questions and answers first between us, and then you'll be able to ask us everything you'd like. Thank you. Thank you, Saskia. So we're gonna uh, initiate our uh, question and answer session amongst ourselves, and then we'd like to open it up to um, the audience as well. So I'd like to start, actually. Mike, um, how should 
the Ministry of Tourism be organized, in your opinion? Well, I would just increase it like crazy. Uh, I would, I would uh, spend more money. I would hire hundreds, maybe thousands of people. Of course, it would depend on the size of the country and um, how much, how aggressively they want to attract tourists. But um, there's a lot they can do. They can do research. They can uh, do polls. They can uh, interview the tourists coming in, find out why it is that they're coming and what kind of tourists they want to attract. Uh, they can hire big marketing teams. They can hire business strategists. And um, yeah, I think they could spend more money and spend more resources because it's worth it. Uh, you know, they spend a few million and they end up getting billions of revenue into the country. If you think of it like a business, it's an investment that's worth it. And uh, I have a question for Hamza. Um, what are the impacts in this field, in the uh, cinema field, um, that Morocco managed to create on a global scale? Um, well, it's actually influenced so many aspects of Morocco. Um, if you search for Warjazaj, for example, or even that region, um, few 30, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, which was a totally different place, people still lived in a rental economy, which means like uh, we're just changing goods with each other and etc. And uh, there is people who have all the power in it, who can say where the money goes and when the money doesn't go. But here we created a economy that uh, includes all the people in it. Uh, people from all around uh, Morocco. Um, so you create jobs. In the same time, it's not just Moroccan people, it's also people from some Saharan Africa who are working there, people from Algeria, Tunisia, people from coming from European countries or Western countries in general. Uh, so it created this uh, economy uh, which is based, m which one of the, its strengths is cultural exchange and cultural dialogue. And uh, the impacts of such a um, creative economy, actually, is uh, very important, especially on a social and political scale. scale. Because here you can have examples of uh, cultural diplomacy or one of the aspects of cultural diplomacy where you can build a relationship with other people coming from all, around, all over the world. And at the same time, you can talk about pushing these issues. One of the important examples in this um, in this field of economy in Morocco, in this industry, it's one of the a movie called Indigen. It means indigenous. It's uh, made by a French Algerian um, uh, director, and it uh, it has so many actors coming from uh, North Africa. And um, when you go there, you can speak with people that are living there, and you can see that there was this uh, way of bringing back a history of North Africa and, and France in that region and talking about uh, some a sensitive issue um, about the um, North African soldiers that fought with France in the Second World War but didn't get the recognition because after colonialism, the government of France in 1959 chose to uh, cancel the pensions for those North African um, uh, soldiers. But with this movie and with the people that work there, actors, and even the population of the region, you create this uh, conscience, collective conscience. And after that, there were so many uh, uh, journals and um, in the media uh, that spoke about this movie. And you have uh, that whole decision that France made in 1959 uh, re-evaluated. Re re so the impact is actually very big. And um, countries in that region, in my opinion, should try to follow this model of trying to make all of their weaknesses a strength, and uh, so we can create more uh, trust and dialogue, especially in our time where security threats and uh, stereotypes uh, are really coming in the way of uh, effective uh, problem solving. As for me, I would like to ask Zaskia for a question about your subject. Um, do you think that uh, online creative economy is able to bring sustainable tourism to a country? I think it definitely can help a lot. Like even you mentioned, and Mike mentioned, thanks to only creative economy, well, to creative economy itself, it was able to bring a lot of tourism thanks to movies. And even in China, there are people who are going to see the places where 
the, the movies Avatar was filmed, and all over the world you have places that are gone to just because they've seen it online, because they've seen it not only as a documentary, but because it's been posted to them as, as an actual, like, actually the movie or a game. For example, you have Japan that with their online games, their animation, they, it's amazing how it grew. The economy, it helped in questions of tourism. Most of tourists go because they've played a game. They even learned the language because of it. Then we have Korea that it's also used online a lot to expand its creative economy. So especially East Asia is the one that has taken a lot of advantage. And then in more of that's through online creative economy. East Asia has grown a lot. Hong Kong, Taiwan, they've all grown. And then if we're going to talk about a specific creative economy, yeah, we have the whole world is being influenced. So I agree with all of you that we should definitely uh, countries should start to focus a little bit more on the creative economy because it definitely can bring a lot of physical tourism, bringing a lot of money, as Mike mentioned. Um, I would actually like to ask something to Whitley. Um, it's about your topic. If a country wants to start a nation branding campaign, where will they begin? Well, I would say that uh, the first step in starting an effective nation branding campaign would be to take a good, honest look at what your country has to offer. Um, and that's looking at the economy, also looking at things like tourism, culture, history. Um, what is your country known for? What do you want it to be known for, more importantly? Um, and also look at essential areas uh, that maybe need more improvement. If you don't have basic infrastructure for supporting uh, foreign investment, then that's something that you're going to need to work on before you can really go after those uh, companies that are looking f to become multinational companies. Um, it's also not something that a government can do alone. This is definitely a public-private partnership. You need to look for partners in the community, and you really need to engage your citizens actively to uh, be a part of this movement. And another thing is there's lots of countries that are already doing this besides Ireland, Singapore. India is really working on this right now. So it's, it's not impossible. It's being done. And there are examples out there that are great examples to look for, um, for ideas and inspiration and kind of a framework to uh, build upon for your own country. So um, I would say it's definitely doable and it's something that every country should be looking at working on for betterment of their economy. And something about what you said about Ireland, I think one of the biggest reasons that it attracts so much foreign direct investment is because of the low taxes there. Mm -hmm. And being from a country like Norway where the government just taxes everything, uh, the result is not a lot of businesses want to work in Norway. They don't want to move their companies to Norway. Um, Norway taxes things and they have a good welfare system like free education, free health care. Uh, they don't get a lot of foreign direct investment, and that's a problem that, that Ireland, at least, does very well. Yeah, the tax incentives are huge, and also um, they offer 25% um, on R&D investment. So a lot of companies are now putting research and development operations there because they're getting 25% of that money back. Um, and that's also expanding. Whichever businesses are moving there, they're not just putting, um, you know, a call center there. They're actually wanting to employ really skilled, highly employable people, and they're doing great things, making great um, scientific research. And um, it's, yeah, they offer a lot of really great incentives that are definitely um, notable for other countries. So, is any member of the audience have a question for us, people? A few. Yeah. Get up a mic. Excellent. So, I'm glad that uh, we are keeping this proactive. We'll start in the back and then go to the front. And please also introduce yourselves for other members of the audience who may not already know you and where, where you're from. Who was first? Oh, ladies first. Um, hi, my name is Neema and I'm from Canada and I really enjoyed your presentation. I think you did a good job demonstrating that how nation branding can be used as a tool as soft power when bringing attraction to a country. Um, however, I would also like to ask if you believe that nation branding can also be used as a tool in which a country could cover up um, 
negative policies or negative aspects by bringing just positive tourism and representing mainly positive tourism. For instance, I want to like represent the case study in Dubai with the Palm Islands. For instance, um, the islands are a big touristic hub. It brought um, great economic strength to the country, um, to Dubai, and it also um, brought many jobs and many opportunities. But the islands are also um, having erosion and a lot of like ecological problems. So do you think that nation branding also has a negative approach um, in a t as a tool to cover up policies and problems within the country? I mean, I think that uh, any tool like this could really be used in an abusive way. So it's hard because, um, I mean, there's examples of that with a lot of different countries, that, and that's a really good example that you bring up too. But I think that um, it comes down to just, uh, you know, trying to use it in a positive way, and you can't obviously control what a country is going to do with a tool like this, but um, unfortunately there is going to be a negative aspect uh, to something like this. Thank you. Do you have any? Hello, um, my name is Alice Nain. Um, very lovely presentation. I liked, you made a lot of valid points about using Hollywood, expanding Hollywood to the rest of the world, um, and the point about countries having to be infrastructurally sound so that they can attract foreign investment. But I also think that you sometimes you can't just limit it to movies. You can make it like um, with art and other parts of culture, like with artistic residencies that take place in different countries. And you know, aside from the cultural value, people learn things. But the question I actually really wanted to ask, uh, speaking in a realistic context, in the case of countries with really terrible governments and not particularly great infrastructure, do you think that it's possible to market people instead of things and places? Because tourism ideally is about going to places. What can you market the people of a country as opposed to the things in the country? That's my first question. Yeah, of course. And it's, it's two different types of marketing. Um, marketing tourism would try to be bringing people into the country, spending money, but you could market people music that would, uh, that would bring the country money without anyone even having to go there, and buying CDs or movies or other things, art, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Okay. Um, the second question I have is uh, with travel restrictions, because some countries don't have as much access. How do you think that would work out in the face of the current immigration crisis? Um, I can answer that. I'll try. <laughs> um, basically, the thing is, um, we're living in a globalized world where everything is interrelated. Um, I think your question is uh, an excellent question, but you have the answer maybe in the first one, which is government. Uh, when people um, choose to do something in their country, um, it uh, creates uh, a huge uh, wealth, uh, which is um, a human uh, wealth. And this kind, you cannot find it anywhere. The problem with immigration um, is that people right now are looking for better places to live and to work for, because they're qualified and they can do that. But at the same time, um, their country doesn't give them the best incentives. Therefore, here you can find the problem, which is, why does my country doesn't help me? And me, I want to go to another country, but I don't know if I can find help there. So it's basically, you're trapped. But if, if you find any sort of creative um, way to bring all everything into your path, and therefore use uh, the, the wealth that you have in your country or in your community, then you can definitely fight any sort of uh, problems you are facing, whether economic or social, uh, on a global scale like immigration. At the same time, immigration is not that bad. When people f from your country goes, go away, they bring money back to your country. Um, and that might be positive uh, too. But you really have to organize it in an effective way because it's not easy. You have a failed government that cannot organize anything, so who will? Uh, maybe it's you, the civil society, that can do that.
Danke. Thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, one of the suggestions you, you bring us to us about how to improve tourism, you said that uh, you should, we should expand the Ministry of Tourism. But uh, based on the experience you have in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, if you expand the Ministry of Tourism, most of the money, instead of going to brand the country name or, brand, or marketing tourism uh, attraction, or improving uh, tourism infrastructure and uh, in the tourism environment in general goes to the people, goes to the people in the ministry. So it will maybe 70% uh, of the budget in the Ministry of, 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 of Tourism go to the people instead of going on an on a, on a improve, improvement of the tourism sector. So I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nice suggestion. For me, I think we should invest more on the, on the sector, tourism industry as an industry, on the marketing, on the building infrastructure, and, the, and, the, on, the, and the, on, the, on the national branding, as other people said, instead of uh, investing on the people. Because tourism is not all about the, about the, the number of the people who are in the industry. It's about how the, even if you are few, but if you are efficient, your country will, 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 can, can develop more. For example, in Morocco, Morocco they are, they are attracting, uh, attracting uh, more than 10,000 tourists per year. But it doesn't mean that they have been huge tourist ministry, but they are doing very well in the in in tourism industry. So it's just my comment. Uh, absolutely. It's, uh, it's different from country to country, and each country has to look at what kind of tourists they want, and how many they mm -hmm. want, how many they can afford, and um, yeah, to develop the best plan for whichever strategy they have. Um, um, my name is Jagrati. Uh, I wanted to ask you, like there are certain countries who have, uh, they lack in infrastructure and everything, but do you think it is also more important to focus on the local people who like uh, training them or making them more hospitable so that they're more welcoming to foreigners? How, how important do you think that is? Because foreigners are not only dealing with the people of the tourism industry, the various sectors that are related to tourism, but they're also dealing with local people going to shops, because that, uh, looking at attractions or going shopping can, uh, it causes a lot of interaction with the locals. So how important do you think the domestic government has to pay attention to their local uh, people and not just the people who are directly in, uh, related to the tourism industry? That's, that's very difficult. Um, yeah, yeah. Of course, it's a problem. A government should invest in security and making sure uh, that the, their country citizens are treating the tourists well, but you can't really go to each person in the country and say, hey, behave when tourists are here. <laughs> what, what do you guys think? Um, Maybe there's some solution. Yeah, I also think that it's very hard to change the social aspect of it because influencing that amount of people, it's quite hard. Uh, so what I've seen that people are doing in some countries is they're actually making ads telling that we are a hospitable, we are very sociable, we are the best host. Like they're saying that not to the foreigners, but to their own people in their own TV. And then there are places like, for example, in China, where there is a law that says that if you hit a person with a car, if they're a Chinese, you go through normal court and stuff. But if he's a foreigner, then you're probably gonna end up in jail like through a long time. So there are different tactics that countries are using, but it's definitely being approached by many of them. Yeah, I, I think that you bring up, I think that's a great point because even um, to go into the foreign direct investment side of that, as, as well as tourism, it plays a huge part. And Simon Anholt actually has created a um, nation brand sort of index of uh, perce country perceptions. So you can go in and you can look up, um, I believe it's like seven or eight different factors, and you can look at uh, what people from you know, the United States think of people in China. And it, you can look at um, factors like uh, the people or the culture or uh, the environment, things like that. And you can actually, they've done polls and things, and you can see what the perception is um, from one culture to another. And this is a huge part of foreign direct investment, and I know tourism as well, 
And so it is something that I think is very important and should be a huge part of nation branding campaigns. And I think that one way to relate it to the people is that, um, you know, to, to boost the economy and to boost the, um, I guess, the quality of life, if you're looking to increase tourism and increase foreign direct investment, is that you do need to be like accommodating to other cultures when people are moving there for jobs or, move, or coming there to visit for tourism. And like this is actually helping your economy. So the more welcoming you can be, it, you know, you're only helping yourself really. So maybe marketing that way would be um, a better approach. If I can add something quickly, is that the fact that now nation branding the thing that it can really rely on is the fact that everything is trending. Economy is now should not, it's not just, I, I offer the best um, product, so come and, come and take my product. Everybody now can offer a good product because we're, we're living in 21st century. It's, people are creative, people have the tools to do anything. What, what's actually good for a country is the fact that the country should be ready to go on to another country or not a lot of countries and to tell them, well, this is who we are. So. I'm coming to see who you are and come to me too, and then we can create so many projects, so many things. I have a lot of people that can work with a lot of people of yours, individually, collectively. So it's basically a nation branding, what's good about it. And of course, we, what's better about it is, we already said that, is the fact that some countries like, for example, like are just giving an image that it's not really their image. But what's good about, about that is that the positive effect it, that your image and the things that you are bad in can become good because you're getting influence. We should maybe let, let this idea of, well, this is my country, so mind your own business go away because we're not living actually in just one country now, we're living in a whole world. So it's maybe in nation branding, what it should concentrate on is the fact that it, what it should be really a open uh, strategy to get to know others and then rather than just making yourself look good. Very good points. We have time for maybe one or two more questions or comments. Contributions from the participants. Or are you ready for the lunch break? We've kept you here. Do you have a question, Mark? No? Um, yeah, I was just going to respond to maybe the point you just made about nation branding. Um, and I think, again, you, you made a good point in this sense. It's not just about promotion or advertising, but the idea is how do we better understand the countries? And as we've spoken about in the classroom, I think it's just as much, much of an asset for you to present your weaknesses as well as your strengths, your successes as well as your failures. And I think that is a better way to build trust. And uh, even though it may seem you know, strange, why if I'm trying to sell my country would I talk about weaknesses, I think in the long term that can help. Uh, and one has to see when it comes to tourism how that is done. Uh, of course, you know, I remember in the times of the Soviet Union, when they were doing all kinds of cultural diplomacy, uh, they would bring tourists also to very strategic places for very strategic reasons, and they would show certain aspects of, of the Soviet Union, but not other aspects. And that's common practice, of course. You want to, you know, normally show the best things uh, of your city, of your country. But that, I think, had also a counter effect, and really in terms of building trust, of course, has many disadvantages. So that's every country has to decide for themselves, but I think that is an important balancing, uh, just to see how it's done. Uh, and by just hiding problems or hiding, you know, negative things isn't necessarily always going to be an asset. Uh, um, but I think that's the exciting thing about cultural diplomacy-based tourism. You know, if it does exist, I think it does exist in certain cases, it can exist more. Um, that could really be a win-win situation where it could help countries to bring actually money in. Uh, and it can also be a way of, you know, dealing with the environment in a responsible way sustainably and hopefully uh, promoting countries. Uh, but there, there's many more experts in the conference uh, who can tell you more than, than I can about that. But I think the, the interest uh, from the side of the ICD is very high when it comes to those issues. But, uh, but I thought the panel was really great to also to, in particular, get the issues out there. Uh, I think that's the goal of such a panel, just so we can get our minds spinning. Uh, and we have a couple more days to continue those processes, as well as a lunch break. So we have some nourishment from the mind, now we have some nourishment of the body. Are there any other final questions or comments before we break uh, the morning session? Or for the panel, I don't know, any concluding remarks or statements or anything? Or? No. No? Uh, all right. Well, then in that case, let's please uh, all together extend our gratitude to all of the panelists for the opening panel discussion.